Hi. Um, I was listening to all the brilliant thoughts, um, and I was thinking how much, uh, to what extent we have capacities to um, reflect on what we are and what the world is all about around us. Um, I was always thinking that mothers are, are unrelenting when it comes to their kids, thinking that um, all of their kids are brilliant. But today, to, through the video, I uh, was reminded that some of them think that um, they're so exceptional that they're crazy. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about my passion that I've developed over years, um, and I realized recently and the roots of the passion I have goes back into my childhood, which I noticed that a lot of people around here have the same experiences. Um, I was a very happy child um, until I went to school. Um, and um, I started failing um, desperately, um, getting all the failed grades, and um, having this um, traditional mother who thought that her kid was brilliant, um, I had to kind of um, become a pendulum between the, the failing school, um, the school failing me and my mother that thought I was absolutely brilliant. And since I didn't have a room for negotiation with my mother, I had to find a way out of the situation. Uh, so I started thinking how I can retain the memories that I receive um, around me because I have a problem not remembering things. And in school, I became a shy and scared kid because I was so afraid that people would ask me things I just forgot. Um, so I, th I started looking at how could I hold to my uh, memories, um, thinking that, um, and I found my key. Uh, it was um, every time I would see something, I would ask always why I see that, because what I saw, I could never retain. Uh, it had to have an explanation for me uh, to decode whatever I was seeing for my brain uh, demon programs to run the background programs. So um, this is where the roots of my passion uh, are. And I want to start from here, and um, I want to invite us back in history, because I, I want to talk about a case. There are many examples, but the one that I'm very infatuated with is uh, the most famous duel in Japan, in medieval Japan of 17th century, between two... Uh, warriors, um, samurai, uh, which happened in the southern Japan and in the pop culture of Japan is very, very famous. Um, and uh, it's being consumed um, in everyday lives of Japanese, and it's, it's, it's a fascinating story. I don't know if I can make it fascinating the same way as it was. Um, the two guys... Um, Sasaki Kojiro. Uh, before going there, I, I just want to give a, a short context of, of the medieval Japan. This is a period when they were out of the wars. Um, they had this Tokugawa shogunate, so they, uh, the wars were over, the warring clans were uh, stopped fighting. But, you know, it happens with the warriors. They never lose the urge to fight. Uh, it becomes a habit. Um, so um, the samurais would go around and ask for duels, um, and uh, Miyamoto Musashi, who was um, a very non-conventional samurai, if you were to look through the um, code of the warriors, he, most of his life he didn't have masters, so he was a ronin, um, you know, roaming the country, being on his own. He never respected the clothing code uh, of the samurai, so you would see him in tattered clothing, unclean, um, very unruly, um, not leveled. And then you had on the other side Sasaki Kojiro, who was highly revered by the Japanese uh, society. He was already well established, well fam famous for his fights and duels and for the school he had established uh, by, by that time. Uh, Sasaki was um, revered also because he fully followed the Japanese tradition. Um, in a way, he was the holder of all these rituals, whereas they had this outcast on the other side with Miyamoto that was always challenging what, what being Japanese was all about. They, um, the duel happened on April 13th of 1612, so according to the ritual, Sasaki Kojiro was on, uh, at the site on time, and 
Miyamoto was not there. So this was an insult to the warrior of the time. I think this would be an insult to the warrior of uh, current times. And um, it infuriated um, Sasaki Kojiro, and he didn't even know what was happening. Um, for him, there were no um, explanations why this could occur. Uh, whereas Miyamoto was doing this on purpose. He perfectly well knew the traditions of Japan, and he knew that this was going to take off uh, his enemy. So after two hours uh, making uh, him wait, he appeared uh, with a wooden stick. This was a, another insult to a warrior that had perfected for, for years the art of uh, swordsmanship. Uh, and with two blows into the head of Sasaki Kojiro, he killed the guy. Um, he was ousted by the Japanese um, uh, culture, and he went dark into the temple to write the most famous book um, on strategy, which is the book of five rings that we read and we are fascinated today in the corporate world. Um, the soldiers use it a lot, and people who are very interested in strategy. Uh, the basic difference of these two, both of them knew the tradition. One had a worn-out knowledge memory. For him, the knowledge was not there anymore. He only had the habit, in a way, the urge to be Japanese. The other one perfectly well knew the tradition and also always challenged what being Japanese was all about. And he won, because the duel is not only about you know, uh, rituals, it's also about winning. Um, now about the theory that I'm, I'm thinking, and it's very much related to, to the um, story that happened centuries ago in Japan, and, and we experience it every, in our everyday lives as human beings and as groups' identities. What happens is that once we win uh, in a case, we record it in our memories, and then we start doing it again and again. And it turns, over time, it turns into a habit. The knowledge wears out. And we do it again in, co in contexts that have gone. Uh, so our ability to always be in a cognitive and action is really critical for who we are and for carrying on who, we'll be, who we will be. Um, I think uh, when looking at the science and what it was concentrating on, I saw that they are looking at information most of the times. And there are a few studies that concentrate their um, you know, focus on knowledge and identity. And I thought that what if we come up with an economic model that would measure to what extent when we act, our action is in full cognition. And um, my time is up, just one minute, and I'll... And, and that's where I started. I came up with a thought of... Um, power, elasticity of knowledge. And um, in order for me not to retain the entire information in my brain, I came with an associative uh, label, and I go call it Gregory Peck. So this is the Peck thing. And I think through the uh, measurement of um, responsiveness of power to the knowledge, which really brings about the identity shift, we can measure to what extent groups are able to evolve into the future or which groups are at the risk of um, you know, dying out. And also, it, there was an aha when I was thinking on those thoughts. I said, oh my God, I can even measure when revolutions can break out. Not that I'm going to be like Che Guevara, running around everywhere where there's revolution, but definitely observing um, all these occurrences. Uh, and my final thought is that if we want to have an identity, if we want to uh, continue, uh, we need to always challenge who we are. And seeing what, what we see is not enough. There is always a question of why do I see whatever I see. Thank you.